Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Have you ever gone blind? I'm not talking about permanent, full-on blindness, but like temporary blindness, maybe when you have opened the windows after a good night's rest in a totally dark room and the sun hits your eyes and you can't see for a moment. Or maybe when you are walking in that dark room and the builder for some reason put the light switch all the way away from the door and you can't see anything and you're stumbling around trying to find it. Or maybe you had a temporary blindness for medical reasons. Maybe you got hit in the head at the wrong spot or had a stroke or any sort of thing that caused your sight to be temporarily lost. Then you know that it is not very fun. It's not good. It's disorienting. It prevents you from doing the things that you are meant to do. It causes you sometimes to feel dizzy, sometimes to stub your shin on the coffee table or a chair. Basically, what it does is it prevents us from clearly seeing the reality of the world around us. Or if you're like me and without these things, you're basically blind, like all of you guys are just colors and shapes right now. Try taking these off and going about your normal morning routine. Don't drive, okay, but put them back on before you drive. But just out of curiosity, try that out. It doesn't work very well, I can tell you, because all the outlines of everything get blurred and you can't see how far away things are, how close they are to you until you walk right into them. But you can be blind in more ways than one. Not just physically blind, but spiritually blind as well. And in the scriptures... Both of these presentations of blindness are given to us. The scriptures often refer to blindness or lack of sight in both of these ways, both the physical lack of sight and the spiritual lack of sight. When we're blind spiritually, it means not that we can't see the chair in front of us or the person that is speaking, but that we can't see the truth, that we can't see the reality of the way things are below the surface. Well, restoring sight is the only specific miracle that's mentioned in the Isaiah reading that Jesus reads in the synagogue from Luke chapter 4 this morning. And the, restore, the restoration of sight is one of the things ascribed specifically to the Messiah because it's talking about this spiritual restoration between us and God. That only once the Messiah arrives can we truly see what's going on between us and God, the real reality that is around us. So when Jesus reads from the scroll of Isaiah, he's talking about the anointed one, the Messiah. But not only that, but right after he gets down from reading that, he says these scriptures have been fulfilled in your hearing. In the Greek, it's literally in your ears. Right now. Well, those people had gathered to listen to Jesus' teaching in the synagogue. And those people that day were blind. They weren't physically blind. The text even tells us that they fixed their eyes on Jesus after he sits down from reading. But they were spiritually blind. They couldn't see the truth. And we're going to look at why that is. And we can tell by their reaction to all of what Jesus has to say that because of their blindness, they react a certain way. But I want to encourage you as we meditate on this text, not just to think about their blindness, but to ask yourself this question, am I blind too? So if we go back to the beginning of the text, and Jesus is reading the scroll from Isaiah, we can extrapolate from what is said in Isaiah that something is seriously wrong with the world and something is seriously wrong with us. After all, the way that we're described as some, as, are as a people that are in desperate need of good news, release from captivity, restoration of sight, and healing from brokenness. So that means that the anointed one is coming into a world that's defined by hopelessness, blindness, captivity, and brokenness. 
something is seriously wrong with our world and with us. But judging from the way the people receive Jesus, are they aware of this truth or not? It doesn't seem like it. In fact, if you go through those qualifications, blind, captive, broken, and hopeless, those don't describe people or a world that is capable of doing anything about that situation themselves. If you're captive, you can't free yourself. That's what the definition of captive basically means. If you're hopeless, your spirit is broken and you have no desire to be free. If you're blind, you have not even the wherewithal to see the situation you're in. You might not even know that you're captive. So we need somebody from the outside. Someone from outside this blind and broken and captive world who has authority over it to rescue us from our predicament. Thus, God's promise and prophecy in Isaiah that Jesus read prophesies this anointed one, the Messiah, for that very purpose. Enter Jesus. Prior to Luke 4, we have him being baptized and the Holy Spirit of God coming down on him in the form of a dove and, and the Father in heaven saying, This is my Son with whom I'm well pleased. He's anointed by the Spirit of God and sent out to begin the work that God has of releasing the captives, of restoring the sight to the blind, and healing the broken. And how is he going to do that? Well, the text says he's going to preach the good news to the poor. And when it says poor there, it's not talking about money. It's talking about every single person in the world. The poor in spirit. Those of us who are blind. So the reading in Isaiah is announcing that because the world is hopeless, captive, blind, and broken, the anointed one, Jesus, possessing the Spirit of God, has come to bring hope. He's going to preach the good news. He's going to release the captives by preaching forgiveness. The Greek word used here for release, or as we read in ours, liberty, liberation, is the same word used for forgiveness. He's going to recover the sight of the blind by revealing the truth of God. And release the broken ones. Repeated release emphasis here. Because he's not coming for a temporary release from our sin or an atonement. But a permanent and eternal release from captivity. So Jesus reads this. And he sits down. And the scripture text literally says. And all the eyes of everyone gathered are fixed upon him. So when you fix your eyes on something. That means you're really looking at it. But do they really see Jesus? Are they able to really see what they're looking at? And while they're all looking at him, he says, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And their initial reaction is pretty good. They're amazed and perplexed. They're a little bit confused. And they're a little bit confused because they can't quite see Jesus as he is, as he's presenting himself, because it follows up here and they say, isn't this Joseph the carpenter's son? And yet he's saying, I am he. I'm the person this scripture is talking about. But at first they're marveled, they like what they're hearing at first because his words are full of grace. So it seems like they're tracking so far. Their eyes are on him. They seem to be seeing what he says. But in the book of Luke, and this will be pertinent because we're in the, the, we follow the three-year lectionary, and this year the focus of the gospel readings are on Luke. And Luke has a specific way of presenting Jesus. He presents Jesus as a prophet. The final, ultimate prophet, the last messenger sent from God, completing the words delivered to God's people. Right, we believe that Jesus has fulfilled all things. There's no more word needed to be revealed from God. It's fully revealed in Jesus. But he has two sort of phases of this revelation from Jesus the prophet. The first is prophet as teacher and miracle worker. And the people like that one. They like the teacher. He's coming and he's preaching the good news, right? He's restoring hope. And look at that. He made that guy walk and that blind person see and he raised that kid from the dead. 
Like, I'm going to travel a long way to see that guy. They like that guy. But then the second depiction of the prophet is the prophet as the rejected one. Rejected by his own people. And they don't like that one. Because he reveals something about themselves they'd rather not face. Well, both of these depictions of Jesus Christ as the prophet are present in our reading in Luke 4. You see, first, when Jesus says the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing... The people marvel at his words of grace. They like what he's saying. And they don't even get to the point of asking for a miracle. Jesus knows that's what they're looking for, and he sort of preemptively mentions it. He says, surely you're going to tell me the proper physician, heal yourself, and you're going to ask me to do what you heard I did in Capernaum. You want a sign, you want a miracle. And all the way up to this point, they're with him. They like what he has to say. They see Jesus. But, and here Jesus transitions to the second aspect of his prophetic identity. But you will reject me just like you rejected the ones God sent before me. Just like you rejected Elijah and Elisha. And not only does he say that, but then he says, because of that rejection, they were sent not to the people of God, but to Gentiles. So let's step back a minute. Their eyes are fixed on Jesus, but do they see him? And here their reaction reveals, no, they do not. As soon as Jesus speaks of this rejection... Their blindness to the truth reveals itself. They don't know the whole situation. They don't know what is required in order for God to redeem the world in Jesus. And so they reject the one he sends and the message he brings. They like part of it. Just like you and I, we like part of the things we hear in the Bible. There are certain things we read and at the end we're ready to say praise to you, O Christ. And then there are other ones that we read that we'd wish were different. And that sometimes, practically in our living, we try to change and live as if they're not true. But what's really striking here is the depth of their rage and rejection. It's a blind rage, if I can use that terminology. I mean, look at what they do. They, they aren't just upset that he, uh, what he taught in the synagogue. They don't just cast him out of the synagogue. But they chase him and carry him out of the city with the goal of throwing him down a cliff and killing him. So much for Jesus, the nice guy. He doesn't seem overly concerned with the reaction of the people who are listening to him to what he has to say. And reminder... This is kind of a big deal because these aren't just random people he showed up to in a random town and started teaching about. These are people who knew him and recognized him as Joseph the carpenter's son. So imagine that for a moment, the kind of rage it would take for you to want to kill somebody that you watched grow up and that you know is from your own town. This is a crazy reaction. But it is a foreshadowing, it's a small event that points us to the larger event of rejection that Jesus is going to face in his ministry. Jesus, the the fully human man, is rejected in his own hometown by his his own people. Rejected to the point of them wanting to kill him. And Jesus, the Son of God, sent to the people of God, to the world that's captive, dark, and blind, and broken, is rejected by the people of God, rejected and hated to the point of death, the death on the cross. Have you been thinking about the question I asked you earlier? But am I blind too? What about you and me? Do we see Jesus even when our eyes are fixed on him? Not just the parts you and I like to hear, but the whole thing. Everything Jesus has come to say and do and teach. 
Well, the scriptures are teaching us this morning that the answer to that question is no. We don't see Jesus. We are blind as well. We're no better than the people of Jesus' hometown who reject his message in the synagogue that morning all those years ago. And we're no better than the religious leaders of Jerusalem who reject Jesus as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and crucify him on the cross. We too are blind, captive, hopeless, and broken. And the ongoing proof of our blindness is the fact that we consistently have this need to come here and confess our sins each week. Even at the benefit of not being at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, but after he's completed the grand work of salvation, we still get it wrong. We still don't see the whole Jesus. We still are tempted to reject the harsher things that he says and the truth that he reveals about ourselves. Surely I'm not that bad. Surely I'm not in the mob of people that wants to toss Jesus down a cliff. And yet, the mirror of Jesus, the words of his law, reveal that truth about us. After all, when we sin, that's basically what we're doing. We're not seeing Jesus as he fully is. We're believing that we know a better truth, and we're going to act on that. We're spiritually blind. But we do not despair in our spiritual blindness, our brokenness, or our captivity. Because when we go back to that reading from Isaiah 61, notice that we had to extrapolate the dark meaning from that text. The purpose of that prophecy was not to highlight the brokenness of the world, but highlighting the solution that God is providing for that brokenness for that blindness, for our captivity. See, we do not despair because we, like the people in Jesus' hometown and the religious leaders of Jerusalem, are the very people the anointed one of God was sent to heal, to release, to restore our sight. He was sent for the blind, the hopeless, the captive, and the broken. He came to preach you, and me, the good news, in order to restore what was lost and heal what was broken. So, dear friends in Christ, your sight has been restored. You are no longer blind. But by the grace of God and Jesus, you now see the truth of God. A truth which is greater than anything we could imagine or come up with on our own. Because the truth isn't just that we are captive in a cell that we ourselves couldn't see, nor free ourselves from. But the truth is that God sent Jesus to break that cell down. Not because we're worthy of his love, but because he loves us in spite of our blindness and brokenness. Our lives are forever changed and transformed because Jesus, the anointed one of God, has come to preach the good news to you to me, and the rest of the world. So now, open your eyes. They've been opened by Christ. You can now see the spiritual truth, the real landscape of our relationship with God. And dear friends in Christ, it is not one of brokenness and despair. It is one of redemption, restoration, release, and freedom. That good news is nothing short of the pronouncing that your sins are forgiven, not because of anything you've done, but because of what Christ has done on your behalf. That the wrath of God, which you deserve, has been poured out on him instead. And instead, you are now righteous in his sight. You're now free no longer living under the condemnation of the law, but under grace as children of God. But dear friends in Christ, we do still live in that world described in Isaiah 61. A broken world, a blind world, a world without hope. Imagine for a moment some of the worst things you've gone through in your life, the suffering, the darkness. And now imagine that Christ isn't present in your life at all. 
That's what it's like for people who don't know Jesus in our world. It's still a place of hurt and despair and darkness. But now the truth has been revealed to you in Jesus. And we know that there's a better end to that story. Yes, that suffering is there. Yes, that darkness is there. But now it has been conquered and destroyed by the light of Christ. The final word isn't death and despair and brokenness, but healing, redemption, and life forever. That is the good news the anointed one of God came to preach. And guess what? He's anointed you to do the same. Now, I have a public ministry calling to preach from this place to a congregation as part of the church of God. But all of the Christians are the priesthood of all believers, and we've been given a call, an anointing in our baptism where we receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, to share this very same news that Christ brought. And so that he can accomplish the very same purpose in the lives of those who hear it and by the grace of God believe. Our world needs those who aren't blind to bear this revelation of Jesus. And so by the grace of God, Despite our imperfections, we carry this treasure of God's word with us wherever we go. This treasure of this good news to share with those who, like us, were hopeless, blind, and broken. So, dear friends in Christ, secure in the knowledge of your salvation, bolstered up in the hope of your redemption and the life to come, let us take that treasure, that good news, to our blind and broken world so that our Lord can continue his work through us until he comes again and everything is light, everything is mended, and everything is life. In the name of Jesus, amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding. Guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, who has set you free from all the things that threaten to harm you. Until he comes again in glory to make everything new. Amen.